Good morning. Still feels a little bit strange down here, but <laughs> the doctor said I'm supposed to be careful about stairs, so that's <laughs> what this is all about. One of the announcements that was not made this morning is an important one, and that is that we have a Christmas Eve worship service. Uh, December 24th, obviously, Monday night at 5 o'clock. I'm assuming that most of you are going to get a long weekend that night. You may not be working that day, so 5 o'clock seems like a good time. Uh, but I hope that you can make it. We're going to have a time of scripture, a time of reflection, a time of singing Christmas music carols as we celebrate Christ coming into the world. Uh, if you've been with us in past years, I'm sure you've enjoyed that service, and I hope that you can come. And please, invite somebody. Bring somebody along, somebody you know doesn't have a service of their own, somebody who may never have gone to church. It's a great time to bring somebody along. So Christmas Eve, 5 o'clock, Hope to see you all there. I, I plan on being there, God willing. Now, I never know what God has in store because he changed my plans quite a bit the past few weeks, but uh, we hope to see you there. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Father, again, we come to worship. We come also to be fed through your word. Speak to us now. Help us to hear your voice. And Lord, help us to incorporate what we hear so that our lives might reflect something of your glory when we leave this place. Amen. I don't know how many of you pay attention to the titles of the sermons in the bulletins. Uh, today's sermon is entitled, Ready or Not, Here I Come. Where have you heard that before? I didn't go see. Popular kids game, I think it has universal appeal. You find it in every culture. And you know how the American version of it goes. You, everybody goes hide except for one person. And he starts to count down. And then when he's finished counting down, he calls out, ready or not, here I come. Kids game but they're not the only ones who play it. A lot of adults are engaged in it as well. Except when adults play it, it's not a game played for fun. It get, tends to get serious because when adults play this game, more often than not, the one they're playing it with is God. And when we start playing with God, it's always serious business. Now, what do I mean when I say that people play hide-and-seek with God? Now, let me try to illustrate, because we have a long history of doing exactly that, and it starts all the way in the beginning with Adam and Eve. You remember what happened. After they disobeyed God's command and ate from that tree of knowledge, the tree, <clears throat> we're told that they heard the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. And when they heard him, what did they do? They went and hid. They want, didn't want God to find them. But whether or not they wanted to be found, whether or not they were ready or not, God came and he found them. He found them. That's only the beginning. Because it seems like men and women have been trying to hide themselves from God ever since. Cain tried to hide from God after he buried Abel in the ground. Saul tried to hide from God when Samuel wanted to anoint him king. 
Jonah tried to hide from God when he was sent to Nineveh. Yet in each and every instance, whether they were ready or not, God came anyway. And he found them. And on that first Christmas night, whether the world was ready or not, God came to earth. And some allowed themselves to be found, but let's face it, most did not. But the point is, whether they were ready or not, God came anyway, and he found them. And today, in our own time, the Lord still comes to the world. And whether the world is ready or not for his coming, whether we want him or to or not, he comes to find us, he comes to confront us. And when he does, we have to respond to his presence. And in the last days, when history as we know it is over, done with, when all things come to an end, again, whether the world is ready or not, whether you are ready, whether I am ready or not, God comes again in power and glory, and he comes to judge the living and the dead, and he will bring his purposes to their final conclusion. So, again and again, whether the world is ready for, or not, whether you and I are ready or not, God comes and he comes to seek us and he will find us. The only question that remains is where will we be when he does? Consider the first Christmas. You know, that holy night when the angels appeared and the shepherds wandered and Mary wrapped her baby in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. In that child, God came. God himself made an appearance in this world. The creator came to visit his creation. And we know that when that night came, when he came that night, Many were definitely not ready. Even though this event had long been prophesied, spoken of, sung about, there were few who were actually ready for it, few who were really prepared. King Herod, he definitely wasn't ready. The mere idea of another king being born was a threat to his ego. It threatened his autonomy, his power. It deflated his self-importance. Not only was he not ready, but he did everything he could to keep it from happening. The scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the powerful, the influential, they weren't ready. They knew what it was all about. They gave the wise men the right answer, but they were doing great on their own. They felt that they were in control. Why would they be interested in the coming of anybody who might disturb their status quo? They already had what they wanted. They weren't ready for Christ. But we also know that there were those who were ready. There were those who were longing to be found. And we can begin with the shepherds. And how eagerly they responded to the message of the angels. The wise men, the magi. How quickly they set out on that year-long or more journey to find that child born in the manger. There was old Simeon and Anna waiting in the temple. And it continued from there with the blind, the lame, the lepers, the sick, the tax collectors, those who were looked down by others as sinners, those who need, knew that they needed forgiveness and mercy, those who yearned for acceptance, ready to be helped. Because they knew that they were in need, they gladly allowed themselves to be found. They eagerly received him when he came. 
And yet when we look at all of this, make sure you notice something very important here. What we have here in this first coming of Jesus is not the story of men and women diligently searching for God until they found him. No. It is a story of God who through his own initiative came to us. It is God who went out of his way to find us. It is God who came to confront us, men and women with his own presence. And we can't overestimate the importance of this distinction because the world is full of religions and ideologies and methods which tell us how we, by our own initiative, by our own effort, by our own striving, how we can climb our way up into heaven, how we can find God. Pay a fee and you can learn techniques to discover the divine. Follow the right guru and you're going to gain access to the meaning of life. Utter the right proper mantra over and over again and you'll become united with the infinite. They all assume that the problem is with God. That somehow God has moved away from us, that he's gone into hiding. The question they ask is, how can I find God? They all assume that it's only through our own initiative, our own effort, that we have to search him out until we find him and confront him. But the birth of Jesus shows us that this perspective is totally wrong. Jesus radically turns everything around. The problem is not how do I find God. Instead, it tells us that God is the one searching. God is the one coming to find. And it's he who comes to us, he who finds us, he who confronts us. We don't have to convince God to say yes to us. No, it's God who comes to us and offers us the opportunity of saying yes to him. And that reality leads us directly from what happened that first Christmas to the present. Because Christmas is not just a time for us to look back some 2,000 years so that we can think about the good old days. Christmas is not just a sentimental journey in our imagination to that little town of Bethlehem so that we can ooh and ah over that baby lying in a manger. Christmas ought to remind us that the Lord who came that night continues to come to us. He continually breaks into the history of our world today and who at this very moment is active not just in the world around us but in our lives as well. Never forget that our faith is not some philosophy of life. Our confidence is is not in a set of ideas about God. And our trust is not in a system of ethical propositions. And our Lord certainly is not just a memory from the past. Something that we can neatly lock up in creeds and codes and bury under centuries of religion. No, we believe in a living Lord who even now, ready or not, breaks into the events of this life, our life. And there is no way that we can hide from his coming and from his searching. As scripture says, there is no darkness that can ever cover us from his side. There is no mountain high enough to exclude us from his presence. He comes. But how many are ready? How many are ready? This is the way John describes it. This is the crisis we're in. The light of God streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. 
They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. Isn't that a perfect description of our society today? We live in a world among people who for a long time have systematically rejected God and his son Jesus. Slowly but surely, our age has convinced itself that God is superfluous. I mean, we've got knowledge, we've got reason, we've got technology, we've got science, we've got power. What need do we have of God? He's not necessary. We keep being reminded that we live in the 21st century, then we've outgrown these ancient myths about gods and about a supernatural creation. And the concepts of sin and guilt have been dealt with with psychiatry and medication, there's no way we we can even begin to fit God into our computerized and plasticized and programmed contemporary world. There's no room for a living, active God anymore. It isn't with it, as they used to say. Well, it may not be with it, but God is there anyway. And he comes today whether the world is ready or not. And let's be honest. It's not not just the world out there that isn't ready. There are times, too many times, God comes to us. To us who claim to believe. And yet when he finds us and confronts us, we're not really ready either. You know, if we're at all in touch with the reality of our own existence, we know that there are times when we've heard the voice of God and we've shut our ears. We've turned our eyes. We've tried to hide from his presence. Why? Because we know God wanted something from us that we weren't ready to give. We know that God may have wanted something for us that we weren't quite ready to receive. We knew his will, we knew his way, and yet we deliberately chose to go a different direction. Oh, we excuse ourselves in many ways. We didn't know. We didn't understand who it was that was speaking to us. We didn't recognize him because of the way he came. Yet the reality is he's there all around us. All we have to do is ask him to open our eyes, the eyes of our faith, and then we'll begin to see the Lord everywhere. And let's face it, how wonderful it is when he comes to us and we do recognize him and we receive him and we follow him because when we do, our lives are never the same again. But even that isn't the last word. Though God comes into the world as we know it today, the world as we know it today will not endure. It's not eternal. It had its beginning. It will have its end. And its end is not without purpose. Its end is not without meaning. It definitely will not be chaos. Because there is a goal toward which everything is moving. There is a plan that will be fulfilled. And it's all in God's hands. Jesus taught his disciples, no, he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. It will. It will. Ready or not, God will come again and he will accomplish his purposes. 
and the final victory will go to him. Do you remember what Jesus promised those who belong to him? He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. I would not tell you this if it were not true. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again. And then I will take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. And the angels told the disciples after Jesus ascended into heaven, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven. And someday, just as you saw him go, he will return. And again we read, And then at that last signal of my coming, the last signal of my coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be a deep mourning all around the earth. And the nations of the world will see me arrive in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And I shall send forth my angels with the sound of a mighty trumpet blast. And they shall gather my chosen ones from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now we live in that interval of time following the coming of God to us in the baby of Bethlehem. And as we live in that interval of time, we live in an uncertain world. We live surrounded by destruction and fear and war and rumors of war and injustice and poverty and terrorism and you name it. We live in a world that's filled with question marks and uncertainty and hopelessness. A world in which nobody seems to have the answer. But as believers in Jesus Christ, as his followers... We have a certain hope. We have a confident assurance. We live in joyful expectation because God is God. And he will come again. And he will prevail. Revelation puts it this way. God calls himself the one who was and is and is to come. Is to come. Remember how the game of hide and seek ends? When the time of searching is over, the call goes out, Ali, Ali, Axon, all in free. And then you are free to come out of hiding. It's safe to come out of hiding and come back to home base. Well, in a sense, we are in the middle of the game right now. But we know how it will end. We know that the one born in Bethlehem is the one who comes to us today and confronts us today. And we know that he's coming back again to bring in a new heaven and a new earth. And because of that, we have no reason to hide anymore. Because if we receive him today, if we allow ourselves to be found today, then that day we will be safe for time and eternity. That day when it comes will take us home. Eternally free at last. Ready or not, he comes. Are you ready? Let's pray. And Father, as we bow in prayer before you, I'm going to ask if there's anybody who is not ready today to examine their own hearts. Because you are here. You have come. And you are seeking them. Lord, may they allow themselves to be found right now. And if your life today is one that needs to open up to God, now is the time. He's waiting with open arms to welcome you safe at home. Will you let him? Father, we thank you for the assured hope that we have that you are coming again. And that if we trust in Jesus now, 
we place our lives into his hands, if we ask him to be a part of us, that he will do that. And he will take us safely home on that day. Father, we thank you for that assurance. We thank you for that hope. Now help us to go out and live in such a way that we proclaim that hope to the world so that others might see, so that others might know that you are coming. Lord, guide us, bless us through Jesus Christ.